All right, boys and girls, are y'all ready to sing before we go to class? All right. I like vacation Bible school. I like vacation Bible school. Songs and prayers and Bible drills and everything we do. I like vacation Bible school. Oh, I like vacation Bible school. I like vacation Bible school. Songs and prayers and Bible drills and everything we do. I like vacation Bible school. All right, now who are we studying about this week? Joseph. Joseph, that's right. He was that guy. I remember him. He climbed up in a sycamore tree, didn't he? Oh, that was Zacchaeus. What happened to Joseph? He got put in a pit. Oh, that's right. And he became the most powerful man in Egypt except for Pharaoh. All right. Uh, where do we read about Joseph? In the Bible. Oh, the B-I-B-L-E. Yes, that's the book for me. I read and study and then obey the B-I-B-L-E. Oh, the B-I-B-L-E. I'll take it home with me. I'll stand alone on the Word of God, the B-I-B-L-E. We have not sung this song all week long. Y'all get your builders out. The wise man built his house upon the rock. The wise man built his house upon the rock. The wise man built his house upon the rock. And the rains came tumbling down. Oh, the rains came down and the floods came up. The rains came down and the floods came up. The rains came down and the floods came up. And the wise man's house stood firm. Oh, the foolish man built his house upon the sand. The foolish man built his house upon the sand. The foolish man built his house upon the sand. And the rains came tumbling down. Oh, the rains came down and the floods came up. The rains came down and the floods came up. The rains came down and the floods came up and the foolish man's house fell flat. So build your house upon the Lord Jesus Christ. Build your house upon the Lord Jesus Christ. Build your house upon the Lord Jesus Christ and the blessings will come tumbling down. Oh, the blessings come down as the prayers go up. The blessings come down as the prayers go up. The blessings come down as the prayers go up. So build your house upon the Lord Jesus Christ. All right. Let's stand up. Y'all ready? I may never march in the infantry, ride in the cavalry, shoot the artillery. I may never fly o'er the enemy, but I'm in the Lord's army. Yes, sir. I'm in the Lord's army. Yes, sir. I'm in the Lord's army. Yes, sir. I may never march in the infantry, ride in the cavalry, shoot the artillery. I may never fly or the enemy, but I'm in the Lord's army. Yes, sir. All right. Y'all have a seat. Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. Little ones to him belong. They are weak, but he is strong. Yes, Jesus loves me. Yes, Jesus loves me. Yes, Jesus loves me. The Bible tells me so. One, two, three, Jesus loves me. One, two, Jesus loves you. Three and four, he loves you more than you've ever been loved before. Five, six, seven, we're going to heaven. Eight, nine, his love is divine. Now it's time for number 10. 
And we've got time to sing it again. Sing one, two, three. Jesus loves me. One, two, Jesus loves you. Three and four, he loves you more than you've ever been loved before. Five, six, seven, we're going to heaven. Eight, nine, his love is divine. Now it's time for number ten. No more time to sing it again. All right, you know why we don't have time to sing anymore? We got to go to class. You ready? All right. Y'all y'all got your hands full with a bunch of lions. <laughs> All right. You guys ready? All right. Y'all have so much fun. Yeah. It is God's work. All right, y'all ready? All right, y'all go to class. Right now, pre-K. What are y'all studying tonight? Joseph. That's right. What are y'all studying tonight? Huh? Oh, okay. Reunite with his brothers. All right. Well, y'all follow Miss Liddy to class and kindergarten. Are y'all ready? Yeah. Y'all had y'all had good week. Y'all learned a lot this week. Yeah. I think y'all have. All right. Y'all go with. With Miss Ruth, this is the last day, and we do have ice cream. That's right. <laughs> vanilla, yes, ma'am. We've got vanilla. <laughs> All right, grades one and two. Y'all are right here. Y'all got Miss Tammy tonight. All right, well, y'all go to class. And grades three and four. Who's teaching y'all tonight? Dale, oh, <laughs> y'all are in for a good class. All right, just be careful. They'll put you in prison. All right, y'all go with uh, D.D. and... <laughs> That's okay, it wasn't that important. <laughs> All right. What are y'all studying tonight? Going where? Miss Katie. Oh, y'all get to ride in the chariot. All right. Well, y'all go. Just be careful. Don't go, be going too fast.
Good evening. It is so good to be here tonight, and I'm so grateful for the invitation. Uh, one of the things that I was uh, thinking about uh, this past week is when Tom uh, first asked me to come speak, I was excited for several reasons. Number one, uh, Joseph's story is my favorite story in the entire Bible. In fact, my mom grew up cleaning the church building, and once we completed our jobs, they had a VHS player that was attached to a TV. Some of y'all know what I'm talking about. And I think our church had like two VHSs, and one of those was the story of Joseph. And I watched that thing over and over again. And so now what happens with my kids every time we go to bed at night and they want a story, I always gravitate towards the story of Joseph. And even just last night, they're like, tell us a story. And I was like, all right. So Joseph, like, please pick something else. And then Cam then asked, do you know anything else in the Bible? So anyway, it's easy for me to want to gravitate towards Joseph. I, th I think to some degree we all relate to his story, connect in one way or another to something in it. Uh, but one of the other reasons why I'm so grateful to get to be here tonight is one of my goals uh, when I first got to Madison was to get to know different people in our area and get, get to know different congregations. And so when Tom called me, I was like, man, this is a quick opportunity to actually get to know some folks here. And uh, I want to get to meet you tonight, and I've already got to meet several of you, and uh, I'm just so grateful to be in this area. And uh, I look forward to all of us working together uh, to reach people uh, in this area in North Alabama. And one of the things that I know that I've already experienced in our little time here in North Alabama is people are hungry. And, and while I look around and I see that there are a lot of people that have a lot of success, they do a lot of great things, there still seems to be something within them that wants something more. And the great news is Jesus Christ has that. And so I, I'm excited about working together uh, with all of North Alabama to, to reach our community. And, and I hope that you guys are uh, optimistic, too, uh, about the future uh, of what God is going to do in this area. So when I was in sixth grade, I'll, I'll never forget that I got something for the very first time that I've never gotten in school before, and that was a schedule. Uh, because up until then, one of the things that happened, I guess, kindergarten through fifth grade was you stayed in the same classroom with the same teacher every day and you never changed classes. Well, I remember first day of sixth grade, I got this little schedule and it said you would go to this classroom and then you would take this class, then move down to this hall and then you would take this class. And I noticed something on that schedule that I have never seen on a school schedule in my entire life. And that was something that was called weights. And I will go ahead and tell you that it was very obvious when you looked at me that my arms and legs had never, ever seen weights. And so when I knew that I had a weight lifting class, I did what every single middle school boy does when he knows he has a weight class. He goes home, gets an old t-shirt, gets a pair of his mom's Ginger scissors, and starts cutting the sleeves off of the shirt so he can show his stick figure arms off to all of his friends. And so that's exactly what I did. And I walked into that weight class literally having no clue what to do because I had never seen weights and we didn't have them at home and I definitely had never lifted them. And so I'll never forget that the high school football coach was the one that did our weight class and he had us all lined up facing those benches with the barbells on them. And he said, all right guys, today what we're gonna do is we're going to do bench press. And I'm like, okay, I don't know what that means, but sounds good. And, and so he said, what I'm going to do is this. I'm going to try to figure out what each and every one of you can lift right now. And we're going to write it on that whiteboard. And then what we're going to do is over the year, as you go through this weight class, we're going to see how you can improve and, and see how much weight we can add. And so you can see where you started at and where you're going. And so he started in the line. And I was the second person as he went down the line. And so he said, I want to ask each of you what you bench. I had no clue what... I mean, again, I had never lifted weights. The first guy was this very big guy. He was, um, back when we played football in elementary school, I don't know if y'all remember this, but sometimes there would be these kids that were just a lot bigger than everybody else. They'd have the R on their helmet because they couldn't carry the football. That was this guy. And so he gave some big number. And I went five pounds under him. And then Coach Perry in front of all those kids goes, it's in, buddy. Why don't we start out at 50? That's pounds, by the way. So he wrote on that board 50 pounds. That was what I was going to bench press. And so I'll never forget that I get down on that bench. And so he lets me know. He said, listen, you're going to get to a point that you're going to lift as much as you can. But when you kind of get to a point where I can tell that you cannot lift anymore, I'm going to be your spotter. 
Now, if you've ever lifted weights before, you know what the spotter does. He's the person that comes along that when you can't lift anymore, he picks it up and kind of helps you go with it. And so I got down on that bench and I, I, I lifted one. And then the second time I kind of come up and I'm struggling, but I get that one up and I'm about to put it on the rack. I'm done. But he tells me one more. And I start bringing it down. I'm like, I'm not going to make it. And then I start to lift and he comes along and, and starts spotting me. And so as he's spotting me, he keeps saying to me, it's in, you got this. But I want y'all to know, it's in, don't got this. I, I was not lifting any of this. He basically was curling this bar the whole time. He gets that thing up and he said, again. And I was like, again? And, and I'm getting to a point, like, as I'm lifting this, I'm like, I'm doing nothing. Like, I am literally not feeling like I'm lifting anything. He is doing all of the work. And so I think we got to like five or six and we put it up there and, and he's a bit real fiery guy. You know, like a lot of times coaches try to get everybody pumped up in the weight room. He's like, yeah, it's and that's what I'm talking about. And I was like, yeah, yeah. Like, and here I am parading around in my sleeveless shirt with my stick figure arms like I did something when in reality, who did most of the lifting? Coach Perry. Now, the reason why I give you guys that illustration is to me, it's a very clear picture of what happens with us as we try to battle temptation in our life. That there are certain times that I think Satan purposefully gives you and I little victories in our fight against temptation so we can think that we can fight that temptation all on our own. That he gives us this opportunity for a little victory after a little victory and so we think we've got this and the reality is, no, we don't got this. And so what, what's going to make us strong is what made me strong in that weight room. It had nothing to do with me and my own power, but the power of the man that was standing over me doing most of the heavy lifting. And, and so what I think you're going to see tonight as we look at the temptation that Joseph experienced in Potiphar's house is that what made Joseph strong is the exact same thing that's going to make every single one of us strong when it comes to temptation. Eventually, one day, you might have some victories time and time again, but over time, your power is going to fade. You are going to wear out. And what's going to make you strong is not your own power, but you being bound to the one that's actually strong. And so what I want us to do tonight is to turn to Genesis chapter 39. And we're going to look at the temptation that Joseph faced. And what's so neat about this text and why I love it so much it's, it's like the writer there is naturally giving us an outline of how to see and approach when temptation comes into our life. So to set the stage, if you're a guest here with us tonight, where we've been and where we're going, if you remember, Joseph had several brothers, and Joseph's dad liked him uh, and favored him, as the Bible says, more than all the other brothers, so much so that he gave him a coat of many colors. And now the thing about Joseph, when he got that coat of many colors, he didn't check it at the door, right? He wore it around in front of his brothers. And, and they didn't like that. And, and to add to it, his dad gave him the clipboard and basically said, hey, you've got all the responsibility in the land. I want you to go check on your brothers. Now, siblings, how would you like if your younger sibling was checking on you to make sure you were doing the work? Yeah, that, that's not going to go well. And so they had already every reason in the world to not like him. And then on top of that, Joseph has these dreams where his brothers are actually bowing down to him. Now, I want to stop here for a second. We all have dreams. We all have goals of what we want to be, what we want to do. But I really believe that Joseph would have been well served to keep that dream to himself. And just because you might have a good idea, that does not mean everybody wants to go fund it. And, and so what Joseph does, instead of journaling his dream, he broadcasts it to his brothers. And in this dream, his brothers are bowing down to him. And they all of a sudden plan this plot to kill him. But then one of the brothers steps up and says, listen, let's don't do that. Let's just throw him in a pit. Now, have you ever been at a point in your life where you've done like a lot of good things and things are going well and then still you have to deal with something hard? Yeah, I think we've all been there. And sometimes when you're in those pits, you can view them as a stopping point. Or you can view them as an opportunity to grow. 
It's kind of like whenever we go on a vacation with kids. Or really, if we just drive down the road with kids, we will clean our car out, vacuum it out, and then there is stuff everywhere. There's food everywhere. So when anytime we're on a vacation, when we stop at a gas station or rest stop, guess one of the things we're doing? We're saying, everybody, pick up your what? Your trash. And we're going to load it into a Taco Bell bag, and then we're going to throw it in the dumpster. Everybody get your trash. And so we view those and use those pit stops as opportunities to get rid of certain things. And, and that's what's happening here with Joseph, that he could have viewed the pit as a stopping point, but what's neat is him, he kind of viewed it as like a starting point. And, and so it is with us that when we go through hard moments, when we go through the pits of life, you could view those pits as kind of like a, a life sentence, or you could view that pit as a life lesson. And that's what I love about Joseph. Whether it was in the pit, whether it was in the prison, he never was really shaken because he still knew what is the tagline of your VBS, that God was still behind his story. That God was still working behind the scenes. And so, of course, they sell them, him to this group of people. He arrives in Egypt, long story short, he makes his way up to second in command in all of Egypt. So that's where we pick up. And so now we're about to see something come across Joseph's play that he didn't ask for. But what you're going to see is that what helped him get through this temptation was not his own power, but he had obviously made a point in his life to bind himself with what is strong. You will be strong for a little while when it comes to temptation. You might have a small victory but eventually your strength is going to fade if you are not bound with one that strong. So let's look at the text together. It says in, in verse 6 of chapter 39, Now Joseph was handsome in form and appearance. I want to stop there. Before you read forward, you always have to wonder and look at when you read any detail or adjective in the Bible, you have to ask, why is this here? So evidently, when this was here, the writer's wanting us to know that Joseph is good looking. Why would that be an important detail? Well, it's an important detail because scholars also believe that Potiphar's wife was also likely a very good looking woman. And the reason scholars believe that is during this day, anybody in a leadership position, similar to what Potiphar was in, they would usually basically have like pick of the land and oftentimes would parade all these women in front of them and basically say, I want her. If you remember the story of Esther, when Xerxes was looking for a new queen, he basically had a Miss Persia competition, paraded all these women in front of him, and he said, I want Esther. And, and the reason why I think that matters, uh, one commentary I read pointed this out, that what you have is a good-looking guy and a good-looking lady. But what you also have with that are two people that have a lot of responsibility, they have a lot of expectations, and they both have every reason in the world to keep their mouth shut to keep this hidden. But still there's something about Joseph that, that he knows that whatever is hidden is ultimately going to always be in the light. That God sees what happens out front. God always sees what happens behind the scenes. But it's not just for Joseph that he didn't want to get caught. What you're going to see about Joseph that made him different than a lot of people, Joseph did not want to hurt the heart of God. And so it says this, that Joseph was handsome in form and appearance. And it goes on to say this, and after some time, his master's wife, that's Potiphar's wife, cast her eyes on Joseph. Now, let's stop there. Now, of course, you're going to read next that it says that she offered or, or suggested to him to lie down with her. Now, did she just jump to, hey, Joseph, lie down with me? No. If you look in that verse, it says that she cast what? Longing eyes. So right then and there, we kind of learn something about temptation, don't we? That it begins where? It begins in the heart. We're going to look at in just a second that it is not a sin to be tempted. In fact, did you know in your brain that there's actually something, um, and I forget what kind of synapse it's called, but there's moments where like you feel something and you think something, and there's this little space in time between what you think and feel and between what you do or say. I don't know about you guys, but I pray for that little space all the time. That between what I think and feel that I'm going to 
give that over to God so that way something good will flow. Also, I pray for that space for my children a lot too. And so notice here that, that she cast longing eyes on, and it could have stopped there, right? And she has a choice right now whether or not to give voice to what she's feeling. So she cast longing eyes, and then it said that she gave voice to it when she said, lie down with me. But he decided to sit down and have a conversation with her and to go into a deeper discussion over coffee, right? No. He said he refused. And he said to his master's wife, Behold, because of me, my master has no concern about anything in this house. And he has put everything that he has in my charge. He is not greater in the house than I am. Nor has he kept back anything from me except you. Because you are his wife. We're going to come back to that in just a second. How then could I do this great wickedness and sin against God? And as she spoke to Joseph day after day, he would not listen to her. I think sometimes when we tell the story, even in the little kids' movies, the one I watched at least, it wasn't day after day. Y'all know what I'm talking Yeah, I see a lot of head shakes. It was just like this one time, right? That we forget that, that it was over and over again. He would not listen to her to lie down beside her or to be with her. Now, I want to stop here for a second. And I want to address before we look at ways to get out of temptation from what we learned from Joseph's story. I want to talk about Potiphar's wife for just a second. And, and what was it about Potiphar's wife that we might say made her so forward? Because keep in mind, if this gets found out, she has a whole lot to lose. Why in the world would this lady be so forward? Well, one of the things that one commentary pointed out that I thought was an interesting point is that she likely felt deprived. And the reason why he said that is that Potiphar was an officer. And so being an officer, he had a lot of responsibilities. He had a lot of expectations. He was going a lot of places he would have never been home. And so maybe he was not giving her the attention that she wanted. Now, that does not justify her doing what she's doing. But it does, I think, also help us understand something. Is that sometimes in life, we might be depri feel deprived of something. This is not just sexually. This could be anything. And we kind of have this mentality of, well, I deserve blank. And, and because I'm not getting this, I deserve X, Y, Z. And so because I'm not getting what I want, I should and I have every right to pursue whatever it is that I want. Now, again, this is with any sin. Because one of the things that I've noticed in this world, and it's even a, a funny statement that a lot of people say, is this one. Treat yourself. Have you ever heard that? I'll, I'll give you the English version of that. Treat yourself. Okay. <laughs> Um, it's if you want it, you get it. If you like it, it's yours. Now, but then you go to Luke 9, 23, and it says not to treat yourself, but what? To deny yourself. And, and Jeremiah even talks about this. He says, the heart is deceitful among all things. Who could even understand it? And I think about that like, just because we have this desire, that doesn't mean that we have to give voice to it. But I also think a lot of the desires at times that we have, we have to understand and identify where they're coming from because they oftentimes will lead us astray. And, and I think about it like this. Why in the world, you know, we, we use that hashtag, uh, treat yourself or, um, you know, follow your heart. That might make for a great hashtag, but I want you to know that makes for a very terrible and dangerous existence. Because the whole reason why we have prisons, why we have police officers, is because countless people follow their heart. The heart can lie to you. But also when I think about her being deprived and feeling like, well, maybe I deserve this, well, maybe I just need this. What I'm about to tell you is something that is so countercultural that we don't really hear that much. And, and even if this was broadcasted on national television, I'd probably get laughed at for what I'm about to say. 
But one of the things that I think we're told a lot in our messaging, especially when I know when I was younger, but I still hear it today too, is that if you have a desire for something, you go after it. And, and that's where fulfillment really is. But I want you to know, especially with what we see happening here, and you may not hear this very much, but the sexual relationship between a man and a woman is way more fulfilling within the marriage covenant. And you don't hear that enough. And so what happened here, she felt deprived, I, maybe. And so she is acting maybe on that. But the other thing I think is this, is that she lived in a culture that was very materialistic in its view of sexuality. I never had heard this before, but a week ago I read something that in Egypt, it was assumed that people would have relations with somebody outside of the marriage covenant. It was actually a big part of their culture that it was assumed that you would do that. They had materialized sexuality. And so what she could have possibly thought is, well, you know what? This is what everybody else is doing. But here's what I want us to know about anything in this world. Culture does not dictate the rules. God does. And, and so what she could have thought, you know, everybody else is doing this. What, why is that a big deal? And getting ready for this, I, I looked up how definitions have changed. And the definition of sex used to start with this. What God created to blank, blank, blank. That was the definition. Y'all, one of the definitions I found the other day was this. It is now being defined as the pursuit of a pleasurable activity. You could use that description of a lot of stuff. Do you see what's happening? We're, we're even in a world today similar to what was then, a world that is objectifying something that God has created to be within a covenant. And so she is very forward, obviously. And so it's at this point now as we shift to look at what Joseph is about to do that we have to also define what temptation really is. And we're going to spend a little bit of time on this because we have time before we get into the how-to part. So what is temptation? Well, I found this definition. I liked it, that temptation is anything that promises satisfaction at the cost of obedience. I want to talk about four things when it comes to temptation. The first one is this. It is not a sin to be tempted. The book of Hebrews actually talks about this. Uh, the book of Matthew and Luke, Matthew 4, Luke 4, they both illustrate in those texts that who was tempted Jesus. Jesus himself was tempted. But Hebrews 4 says that Jesus was tempted, but what? He remained without sin. So it's not a sin to be tempted. And here's why that's important. Uh, before I came to Robertsdale, I worked with college-age students for seven years. And one of the things that is a mentality, I know with them, but I will go ahead and tell you, it still is not something you really graduate out of is that you can be tempted by something over and over and over and over and over again that you start to think that that's just going to be you. Like because you're tempted by that, and that might be your vice, that you might start to identify that as who you are as a person. Here's what I want you to hear. Sin is an event. It's not who you are. But Satan loves to attach the sin to who you are as an individual. That's why when, when I had young people come into my office and say, well, I'm this now. I'm like, no, no, you're practicing that. Or that, yes, that might be what you're struggling with, but I don't want to identify you as that. Sin is an event. It's not who you are as a person. The second thing is this. Not only is it not a sin to be tempted, but this one I think is incredibly important, is that it is not, Nobody in this room, the greatest of Christian, the greatest of elder, deacon, whoever it is, nobody is above temptation. No one. You don't graduate from being tempted. I want you to turn your Bibles real quick to 1 Corinthians. And if someone will read for me 1 Corinthians 10, verse 12. 1 Corinthians 10, verse 12. Wow, 
That's a good verse, isn't it? Because that shows us that sometimes we can be a little bit overconfident in ourselves. Have you ever like seen something terrible happen on the news? Or just somebody do something crazy and you say a statement like I've said, I would never do something like what? That? You ever said that like me? I would never do something like that. This is hard to fathom, but every single one of us are all capable of the grossest of sin. Given the wrong environment around the wrong people at the wrong time, nobody is above temptation. Uh, One of the examples I was thinking of today was um, General Petraeus. Do you all remember what happened with him? He was this guy that a lot of people said would likely run for president and have a really good shot to get it in the future. And I'll never forget that one of the things that started to come out was a situation at his office where someone was having an affair, and he actually said to somebody, man, I don't know how somebody could do that. I would never do something like that. You're given the wrong situation, putting yourself in the wrong atmosphere around the wrong people, not putting up the right kind of boundaries. General Petraeus did the very thing he said he would never do. His career was never the same. Take Heed lest you what? You fall. Every single person is capable of the grossest of sins. There's another passage that we won't go to tonight, but it kind of shows me the importance of what I just described to you about being in the right place and surrounding yourself with the right people and putting in your life the right parameters. It's a psalm that when it was written actually in Hebrew is very different than how it's worded in our English translation. And what I mean by that is in Psalm 1, well actually let's just go ahead and turn there since we're talking about it. Psalm 1, because it shows the progression of how sin works. It says this, Blessed is the man who walks in the counsel of, not in the counsel of the wicked, all right? So blessed is the person. I'll go ahead and translate that Andrew version for you. Blessed, great, successful is the person that does not walk with people that get them to do dumb stuff. And then notice what it says next. He moves from walking to standing. He says now, it's not just that you walk, you know, with the wrong people. You don't need to stand in the way of sinners nor sit in the seat of scoffers. Now, in the original Hebrew, the way it was actually worded was basically like this. Be careful where you walk, talking about the people you surround yourself with, because if you're not walking with the right people, you'll start standing. And what that was basically talking about with the seat of scoffers, the seat of scoffers is basically this idea that you, have, you haven't fully moved into the sin yet, but you're giving it serious consideration. But then when it says this, sorry, sit, sits, that actually means this, that you've now moved in. You don't just move in. It first starts with who you what? Walk with. And then once you walk with them, you start kind of standing around them, and then you move in. It's kind of like Potiphar's wife. She didn't just jump into, hey, will you lie down with me? What did she do? She cast on That we walk, we sit. So we walk, we stand, then we sit. I think that's an important progression for us to see. You just don't get there overnight. Right? Well, how did I get there? Well, I'll tell, tell you how you got there. You walked with the wrong people. You stood there for far too long and didn't get out of there. And now you've moved into something that is really hard to get out of. Be careful well you walk because then you won't move in where you shouldn't move in. But the next thing that I want us to understand about temptation is that there's a big difference between being tempted and being tested. And I think Joseph understood that. What is the difference between a temptation and a test? Any thoughts? Not much. It is hard to tell the difference. Well, one of the things that I think about 
is the Bible talks about in James 1 that God doesn't tempt us. The Bible says that we are tempted when we're led away by our own desires. And then we give voice to those, and then that is what ultimately breeds sin. But God does test us at times, right? You think about in school, why do you have a test? Well, you have a test to advance. You get that grade so you can move on to the next grade. And and that's why I think Joseph was also successful. He knew the difference between a temptation and a test. That he knew that some of these things might be, like you said, I love how you said it, it's hard to tell the difference. But I think he was so close to God that he knew, you know what, maybe this is her trying to tempt me, but in this situation, God is trying to test me. And here's what you'll find out about tests in life. Sometimes some of your greatest victories will come right on the heels of your greatest test. That when you went through something hard, you're like, man, how did I get? It was God giving you that to, to advance you and to grow you. But if you go on to read in the text we looked at earlier in 1 Corinthians 10, verse 12, whoever had that, if you will read verse 13, because this is the good news about temptation. Then we're going to get back to Joseph. So I want to read 1 Corinthians 10, verse 13. It says that God is faithful and God will always give you a way of escape. Isn't that good news? That God will always give you a way out. That maybe in your mind you think, this is just who I'm always, this is just my life because it keeps coming at me. No, God is faithful and he will always give you a way of escape. So now that we have a proper, I think, definition of temptation, let's get back to Joseph's story. So why was it that Joseph resisted temptation? Well, I think one of the reasons is this. He governed his speech. One of the things that I've noticed that gets people in trouble more than any other thing when it comes to giving voice to that temptation is maybe flirtatious talk, sending something through text that you shouldn't send. What I I notice about Joseph, he was very careful about what he said. He governed the words that came out of his mouth. The second thing is this. Notice in the text that he obviously remembered that he had some kind of responsibilities. It says this in verse 8. Remember he said, because of me, my master has no concern about anything in the house. And he has put everything he has in my charge. Every single one of us have to also remember, that. and by the way, the the main thing is the sin is against God. We're going to get that in a second. But we also have to remember this important thing, is that Acts chapter 1, verse 8, the Bible says that as you go, you will be my, it uses this word, witnesses. Witnessing is not what we do. It's what we are. Everywhere we go, We are a living, breathing witness of Christ. And we are either drawing good attention to his name or we're drawing negative attention to his name. And people are always watching. In fact, one of the things that I remember the most about Robert still is kind of like where we sat before we came to Madison. We're still trying to figure out our seat, by the way. I think I've stolen two different people's seats in the first few weeks. This one lady stopped by, she was like, it's okay. And I was like, okay, yes, ma'am. So anyway, I'm still wondering where my seat is. But <clears throat> when uh, we were at Roberts, though, the place where we sat was kind of catty corner to our teenagers. And our teenagers sat on the first few rows. Y'all, I'm not kidding. The whole service, my two oldest, Cam and Cruz, they're singing. But guess who they're looking at? They're looking at the teenagers. They're, they're watching the way that they act. They're watching the things that they do. And, and Cruz on the way to his Bible class, where it was located at Robertsdale, he would walk past the teenage class every single time. He would walk by and slowly just see what they're doing. And, and Cam, 
we asked him last year what he wanted to do for his birthday. And he said, I want to have the teen teenagers over for ice cream. He was three years old. So what I want you to know is if you're younger, there are young people that really look up to you. Remember your responsibilities. But I want you to also to know as you get older, that doesn't change. Because there are so many people that I look up to. In fact, Lorianne and I were just talking about the other day about uh, being at Madison, getting to know new people. And she's like, you know, one of the things that I can't wait to know is, is who are going to be those older ladies that I can look up to. And, and you may not realize it, but, but everybody is looking to somebody. That's why I always tell folks, everybody in their life needs a Paul and a Timothy. Somebody to look to, then someone also to encourage. We all need that. We're, all, we're, we're always bearing witness to Christ's name. We have a responsibility. And, and so maybe as you think about the responsibilities that you have, you might be younger and you think, you know, yeah, if I was married and I committed a sexual sin, it wouldn't be that big of a deal because I don't have kids. I don't have anything to lose. That was the mindset of myself and other young people. I've been there. But here's what I do want you to know that you can lose. And again, the world would laugh at what I'm about to say. You can lose your innocence. But if you're here tonight, and maybe you have, and you thought, you know, Andrew, the problem for me, and this hurts, is that innocence ship that sailed on me years ago. Here's what I want you to know about how good our God is. That he is constantly in the business of restoring what was broken. Through the blood of Jesus Christ, he can bring that back. You're not damaged goods. You are a new creation. God loves you. He's all about renewal. He's all about refreshing and rebirth and new beginnings. So please know that. And, and so maybe you're here and you think, all right, I do have other people looking up to me. That Yes, that's part of it, but I also want you to understand that it's not just about that. If you notice in this text, Joseph made this statement we can't overlook. You are his wife. See, Joseph realized that she was not his. And one of the things that my dad used to always tell me um, when I was going on dates, which was always very uncomfortable, I was like, I don't want dating advice, uh, you know, um, but he loved to give it. Um, but I do appreciate this, and it has stuck with me, is Andrew, never forget that that's someone else's daughter. And he would always say that. Remember that that's someone else's daughter. Remember that that's someone else's daughter. And now I'm a 35-year-old man and I have a daughter. And now I get why that means so much. But I think about it with any other sin, every other sin, it's, it's the same thing. That sometimes what causes us to give voice to whatever sin it is, it can, I'm going to even talk about something sexual, is that sometimes we view it as just, a fling, just a good time. But notice in this text, the fourth thing that I think made him so successful, he remembered what the act was. He called it what? Great wickedness. He didn't say, how could I do this fling? He said, how could I do this great wickedness? He called it what it is. Why is it so important for us to call spades spades when it comes to sin? Why is it so important for us to not try to dress it up and make it sound better? Why is it so important for us to call a sin what it is? Why is that important? Okay, yeah, God hates it. Yeah. And I, I kind of think of, I, I like that because think of it like... Um, the Bible describes a lot of times the holiness of God. And I like the, the sun is kind of like the holiness of God in the fact that the sun provides a lot of good things. It makes things grow. It gives us seasons. It gives us warmth. But if you were just to go up to the sun and go straight to it and take, you know, take it for granted, what's going to happen to you? You're going to burn up and you're going to die, right? That, that, that God is good, but we also have to take what he says seriously because he knows it will ultimately kill us. 
Yeah, that's part of it. But why else maybe is it important for us to call the sin what it really is? Yes, and that's actually the thing, almost verbatim what I had here, um, is that, that it gets very easy to accept it. And you actually can desensitize yourself maybe to it. Anybody else? Any other thoughts? I, I'm going to butcher the thought, but it was somewhat I had shared basically that what um, we minimize, we ultimately at times accept. And so it's important to notice something. He called it what it was. He said, how could I do this great wickedness? Here's the next thing. He remembered who the sin would be against. Notice that it wasn't just, I have responsibilities. And it wasn't just, I could get caught. And when I was getting this lesson ready, I was thinking, man, that's the one that I feel like plagued me the most. But it's hard to outgrow that, I think, even... I'm not just talking about from when you're younger. You, as you grow older, it's that the, the emphasis can be that. I just don't want to get caught. Uh, when I was in, I don't remember what grade, maybe third or fourth grade, um, I looked in the mirror and noticed that like the way that they had cut my hair was a little bit off. And you know, this was back in the day of the bowl cuts where you would like do that and you know it'd swoop your hair, and so my swoop was a little off. And so um, I, I took some liberty, something with me and scissors, I guess. I was like, you know what? I'm just going to go grab my mom's scissors from her sewing table, and I'm just going to just take a little bit of the edge off. Well, evidently, I took too much off. And so then I thought, well, i got to make it equal on this side. Well, then I went to that side, and then it kept getting worse. And so you can, it went from here to slowly coming up there, and I basically had a mullet. But anyway, and so I remember standing in front of the mirror looking, I'm like, Oh, okay. Mom's not going to be happy. She just paid for a haircut, and then I, I did this number on it. And I thought she, maybe she won't notice. So I got those scissors. This is Confessions by Andrew Moment. You didn't ask for it, but you can get it. I got those scissors, and in our trash bag in our bathroom, it had you know, we had the can, but then the bag, between the bag and the can, I put the scissor in there and hit them. Now she won't know. Okay. And so I go to my room, and she's like, you know, it's time for dinner. I'm like, I'm studying. And she should have known that that was obviously something's off. So eventually I have to come to the table. And I walk and sit at the table, and I can, like, nobody's saying anything. And I'm just keeping my head down. I'm thinking maybe they won't notice. And then dad eventually, like halfway through the middle, is like, Andrew, do you want to tell us something? I'm like, no, I'm good. Are you sure there's nothing you want to tell us? No, I don't know why. Andrew, why did you cut your hair? Okay, like it eventually came out. And, 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 and the reason why I give you that example is, is that our impulse a lot of times with sin is the focus on not getting caught or hiding. But I was sitting around that table, and I was sitting in my room, and here's how I felt. Miserable. I felt miserable. And part of the reason why I felt miserable is I knew eventually what was going to happen. It's going to get found out. Sooner or later, it's going to get found. And, and it just, nothing felt quite right. And I, I think back to the garden with Adam and Eve. God gave them a simple way to do life. Love me love each other, and take care of creation. Very simple. That's why a lot of times people are like, man, all, all these commands, yeah, the 600 commands came, it was really simple in the beginning. <laughs> and he said, don't eat of that tree. Well, then, of course, they ate of that tree. And the very first reaction of Adam and Eve was to hide and to blame. So they hid and the Bible makes this point that they heard the steps of God and God walking in that garden. Now, the reason why I think that's such a neat and important detail is there was a lot of stuff walking in that garden. There was lions, there was tigers, bears. But how did they know that was God's walk and not a lion or a giraffe? I'll tell you why, because they had walked with him before. 
And so they, they notice, hey, this is God walking. But God sees this, and they still made the impulse to hide. But then notice what happens when you try to hide it. It then opens up the door for blaming. Because with Adam and Eve then, after God's like, hey, I know what you did. Y'all know what ha- It basically looks like that meme. Y'all have ever seen the one with the Spider-Mans all pointing at each other? You know what I'm talking about? It's like three or four Spider-Mans. They're like, you, you, you. That's basically what happened. You know, she's like, well, the snake made me do it. And then Adam's like, well, the woman made me do it. And, you know, everybody's pointing at everybody. What, what God wanted us to be were, was not hiders and blamers, but confessors and repenters. But it's this kind of mindset that won't lead you down that path. And so what I love about Joseph is that it wasn't, man, I'm going to get caught if I do this. It was, man, I just don't want to hurt the heart of God. Now, how do you get there? I'll tell you how you get there. It's, it's not knowing about God. It's knowing God. That's why I said at the very beginning of this message that what's going to help you ultimately to get out of temptations when they come your way or to face them and walk closer to God is not you and your own strength, but you being bound with what is strong. You can try all the tactics in the world, and they might work for a little bit. And Satan might even let them work for a little bit. But he has power that you do not have on your own. Don't just know about him, know him. And I think that's what helped him. But the other thing that I think helped him is this. Very overlooked fact in this story is Joseph ran. When she said, hey, lay down with me, he didn't say, hey, why don't we do this? Let's hold hands and pray about this. He was out of there. He ran. It says she caught him by his garment saying, lie with me. But he left his garment in her hand and ran and got out of the house. He ran. Do you have certain moments in your life that you kind of look back on? And you, you, at that time, you didn't realize it was a defining moment in your life. But now you look back and you think, man, if I would not have, if I would have stayed in that, my life would look completely different. I have two of those moments. One of those was somebody that I was dating in college. I knew I should not have been dating this person, but I was dating that person anyway. And I'll never forget my college minister um, at that time. He's actually a minister here in North Alabama. He sat me down and kind of talked to me, and I, I tried to justify it all up and down. And I ended up getting out of that relationship. And, and part of it was, I was like, there's going to be pain. And by the way, if you, if you had, and to our younger people, I'll go ahead and tell you, if you're in a relationship that you know you shouldn't be in, it's hard. And I get breaking that off is really hard. But here's the thing. There's going to be pain either way. There's either going to be the short-term pain of breaking it off, or there's going to be the long-term pain of staying in it. And so I realized and understood I would rather take the short-term pain and the long-term pain of staying in something that's going to hurt me. So thanks to God, he came along at the right time and and helped me get out of that. My life, I'm telling you, would have looked so much different. But I also think about a time in high school that I went somewhere, it it really was innocent at the time, I didn't know what was going to be happening there. And while I was there, one of my buddies that was in the youth group with me We had been there for about 30 minutes. He said, Andrew, we got to get out of here. I wish, I want to go ahead and say, I wish I was the one that would have said, we got to get out of here. I was kind of the person in high school, maybe some of y'all can relate, that I was like, yeah, that's bad. Or I'm not going to say that, I'm going to do it. But I just kind of was, you know, knew it was bad, but I didn't take the lead like I should in certain things. But he was like, Andrew, we got to get out of here. And so I I followed him and I, I, I left. Because of what he did and what he said. Well, something ended up happening at that house that night. And what I want you to know, again, like fast forward what I told you happened to me in college. If I would not have left that night, again, my life would look completely different. I'm so grateful that God put the right people at the right time around me. Because going back to Psalm 1, I was walking with people that I shouldn't. And I was standing there, and I was so close to sitting in a place that I should not have sat. Be careful where you walk. Be careful where you stand. You'll never know in the future where that could have taken you. But I look back on it now, and it was a defining moment 
of how God put the right people in my life. She caught him by his garment, saying, lie with me. But he left his garment in her hand and ran and got out of the house. Now, this next one, we don't know for certain. So I did take a little bit of liberty on this one. But I think it's naturally assumed that part of the reason why Joseph was so successful is what, and I don't even think this is a word, but we made it up for tonight. <laughs> it was the result of pre-decisions. It's kind of like what I used to tell young people. The time to decide to be pure on a date is not on the date. It's before you go on a date. Because if you decide on the date, I'm going to go ahead and tell you, you lost. You lost that battle. And, and the reason why I say this is because to me, his example is very similar to what Daniel's is. Because you can't be in a pit, you can't be in a prison and handle it that well if you're not that close to God. Because do y'all remember when Daniel went through what he went through and they were trying to you know, put him in prison. And then he said, listen, if you bow before God, if you prayed to him, we're going to throw you in. He was like, oh man, I got to start praying. He was like, no, this is just an overflow of what I've already been doing. And I really believe that like Joseph probably, he knew he was a good looking guy. And so you have to wonder, he probably thought, you know, I might be in situations like this. So when they come, here's going to be my reaction. I've already made a decision. So much of your Success in your walk with God, I'm telling you, is going to be the result of a lot of predecisions that you make. And, and so what was so neat about Joseph, and we're going to kind of end it here because I know we're running out of time, and I'm going to skip ahead. We won't go to the last two points. But when I looked at this story, I, I shared with you guys that when I was growing up, when mom was uh, cleaning the church building, we would roll that VHS in and we would watch that story. And there would be so many parts of Joseph's story that I'd be like, man, I connect with that one. I get that one. Uh, I feel like Joseph at times. But y'all, in getting ready for this lesson tonight, one of the things that I was thinking about is I think when we read this story, we just naturally assume we're Joseph in the story. I know this might be kind of hard to hear, but I think at times we're actually Potiphar's wife. And here's what I mean by that that sometimes we try to find our meaning and our satisfaction in the garment. Because to me, the saddest part of this story is Joseph runs and she's just standing there holding that garment. That her identity was wrapped up in something physical. And, and I think, isn't that kind of the story of us? That our identity so many times is wrapped up in the garment. It's wrapped up in something physical. So Joseph runs, and one of the things that I put up here that I want to end with tonight is that Joseph was not rewarded at that time uh, for his principled stand. In fact, um, a lot of scholars believe by the way it was written that if Potiphar would have really believed that Joseph did it, he would have killed him. But the, the Hebrew actually just says that he was saddened about the situation, meaning he likely didn't believe that Joseph even did this, what he was being accused of, but he still put him in prison. So here's the thing, Joseph did the right thing and he wasn't rewarded for it. And here's what I want to tell you, that, that you might make a good stand sometimes, that does not mean you're always going to get rewarded for it yet. But one day you will. And so that's why I want to encourage you that when there's those people that come along in your life at the right time and say, hey, it's time to leave, please, 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 please leave. And when you can tell that the people that you're walking with are not the right kind of people you need to be walking with, please, 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 please find a new crowd. And it might seem hard at that time, and you might not even get rewarded for your walking away, for your stand, but one day you will. And, and I look back, like I shared with you earlier, and look at, man, if, I, if those two things would have happened, my life would have looked completely different. Please understand the power of your choice, but also the power of God. Because that's what ultimately helped him get out of this. Was that relationship that he had with God in the first place. Tactics, they last for a little while, but a relationship with him is what will last you a lifetime. So let's pray, and, and then the lesson's yours. God, we thank you for this awesome story of Joseph. 
Uh, we thank you for we, the opportunity we have to learn from him and his life and to learn from his successes. And Lord, as we've talked about tonight, nobody in this room is above temptation. But the great news as we talked about tonight is, God, you are faithful and you will always give us a way out. And so, Lord, help us to be people that will learn from Joseph's example, that we will be people that we watch who we walk with and we watch where we stand. And so, Lord, I pray that you will give us wisdom that we so desperately need from you to see the things that we need to see. Uh, Lord, I ask that you bless the church here and that they will grow spiritually, that they will grow numerically, and that they will make a massive impact in this community. And we ask all these things in your son's name. Amen. <coughs>
next song from the pack that we did. And I thought, yes, I'm going to start pulling names out and giving away the Virginia <laughs> flag. Too. And you got one. I got purple on this one. Did you get a ring too? Is that like Joseph's ring? Yeah. I got purple on mine. Mm-hmm. You got rings like Joseph. What else did Joseph get? Clothes. And did he get to ride in a chariot? What? A talking parrot? Oh, my. <laughs> all right, I think we're all back. I was just looking at these rings that these kids got like Joseph's. That's kind of neat. All right, judges. Here it is. All right. Our winner on the last night is the third and fourth grade that's right here did i do that right all right good job guys all right so everybody has studied all the lessons about joseph and he started off with a coat of many colors who gave it to him his dad and his brothers loved the fact that he had that coat of many colors, didn't they? No. no. They were no, they were jealous. All right, so they put him in a a pit. And then they sold him to some people and where did they take him? Egypt. And then he went to jail. Yeah. What? In prison, yeah, jail or prison. But who was with him the whole time? God, yeah. All right, let's sing. Let's see, what song did I want to sing? All right, let's get our Christian light out. Did Joseph have a good influence? He sure did. All right, this little Christian light of mine, I'm going to let it shine. This little Christian light of mine, I'm going to let it shine. This little Christian light of mine, I'm going to let it shine. Let it shine all the time. Let it shine. Hide it under a bushel. No, I'm going to let it shine. Hide it under a bushel, no, I'm going to let it shine. Hide it under a bushel, no, I'm going to let it shine. Let it shine all the time, let it shine. I won't let Satan puff it out. I'm going to let it shine. I won't let Satan puff it out. I'm going to let it shine. I won't let Satan puff it out. I'm going to let it shine, let it shine all the time, let it shine. All around my neighborhood, 
I'm gonna let it shine all around my neighborhood. I'm gonna let it shine all around my neighborhood. I'm gonna let it shine, let it shine all the time, let it shine. All right, let's sing about Fuzzy. Fuzzy was a caterpillar, he wiggled up the tree. He wiggled long, he wiggled short, he wiggled right at me. I put him in a little box, don't go away, I said. But when I opened up the box, he's a butterfly instead. Now I could never make one, not even if I tried. Only God or Heavenly Father can make a butterfly. All right. Are y'all ready for the research question? All right. Last night, what was the question tonight? What did Israel do with his hands when he blessed the sons of Joseph? I should have asked the question differently. As I should have said, what unusual thing did he do with his hands? Now, he put his hands on the heads of Joseph's sons, you remember what their names were? What was, the, what was his, their names? Ephraim and Manasseh. Very good, Ephraim and Manasseh. But when he put his hands on their heads, what did he do with his hands or his arms? He crossed them, yeah. So that his right hand went on the youngest and his left hand went on the oldest. And that was, that was not the way it was normally done, but he changed it. All right, so that's the question. We're going to start with the boys. Birth to kindergarten boys, here we go. That's exactly what Caden said, Caden Jackson. All right. Where's Caden? There he is, waving at me. <laughs> there you go. All right, now we move up to the first or the third grade. And Briar Kelly answered that one correctly. Where is Briar? There he is. All right, this is a kind of a neat sticker book about Joseph's coat. There you go. All right, now we move up to the fourth through the sixth grade. And Casey Dearman answered that one correctly. Where is Casey? There you are. I'll bring it to you. Good job, Casey. All right, girls, let's see how you do. All right, Hadley Landers. Where's Hadley? Hadley. Somebody spelled her name wrong. It's Hattie. Where is she? <laughs> I was going to say, surely that's not somebody else. All right, now we move up to the first or third grade. Right here. <laughs> this is Lucy. Where is Lucy? There you go. And fourth through the sixth grade. And that's correct. That's Kara Beth. There you go. All right. And now. Seventh grade through adults. Somebody did something funny yesterday. All right. This one is correct. Colleen Dearman. Where is Colleen? There you are. Good job, Colleen. All right. Whew. 
What was your favorite question of the research questions? What was Jacob's name changed to? Who remembers what it was? Israel. Very good. Very good. How many sons did Israel have? Twelve. Yeah. Twelve. What was Joseph's brother from the same mother? Bishop. Benjamin, yeah, very good. All right, I think y'all paid attention. All right, I've got one more question for you. How many were here tonight? And every, I'm not calling on Ricky because he knows the answer. Um, every time except one, that, that we've been right over here. So I'm going to start. I'm going to start right here. How many do you think we had? Twelve hundred. I wish she were right, but it's a little bit lower, just a little bit lower than that. All right, how many do we have? 170, much closer, much closer, but still lower than that, okay? So I'm going to go toward the back. 168. Now, wait a minute. We had 168 Monday night, and we had 168. Wednesday, Thursday night, and also tonight. That's right, 168. Very good. All right, 168. That was a very common number. So 168 tonight, and we are glad that you're one of them. We've still got about two or three minutes before we dismiss. Um, let's sing. Now, we're not going to sing Booster until the very last. We'll sing Booster in just a second. Let's sing, let's sing Blue Skies. Blue skies and rainbows and sunbeams from heaven are what I can see. When my Lord is living in me, I know that Jesus is well and alive today. He makes his home in my heart. Nevermore will I be all alone since he promised me that we never would part. Tall mountains, green valleys, the beauty that surrounds me all makes me aware of the one who made it all. I know that Jesus is well and alive today. He makes his home in my heart. Nevermore will I be all alone since he promised me that we never would part. Jesus loves the little children, all the children of the world. Red and yellow, black and white, all are precious in his sight. Jesus loves the little children of the world. All right, one more before booster. Everybody stand up. In the beginning God made the seas and the forest filled with trees and the mountains up so high and at the top he placed the sky. His fingerprints are everywhere just to show how much he cared and in the middle he had some fun. Made a hippo that weighed a ton. Hip, 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 hippopotamus. Hip, hip, hooray, God made all us. Hip, 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 hippopotamus. Hip, hip, hooray, God made all us. He made the land to stand upon and the water in the pond. He made everything, he made everyone. But some things he just made for fun. Hip, 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 hippopotamus. Hip, hip, hooray, God made all us. Hip, 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 hippopotamus. Hip, hip, hooray, God made all us. All right, y'all ready to sing Booster? All right. You want to stand up and sing Booster? All right, let's do it. Stand up and sing Booster. This is the last time until next year, so we got to really sing it good, okay? That doesn't mean extremely loud, but you got to sing it good. Can you get the adults to help you? All right. 
Say adults, please sing with us. All right, here we go. Booster, booster, be a booster. Don't be grouchy like a rooster. Booster, booster, be a booster. And boost our Bible school. All right. That was pretty. I think that'll last till about next year. All right. Now, the last thing we do, let's all sit down. And as you sit down, we get very quiet because we want to be reverent. After the prayer, we'll dismiss. We can go to the annex for our refreshments. Remember, you can go down this hallway. All right. Children, remember, don't go out in the parking lot. You can go to the annex. You can go out to the, uh, to the pavilion. I want you to be very safe. Let's be very quiet and reverent. Let's bow our heads. Heavenly Father, thank you for this week. Thank you for the time we've been able to spend studying your word. Bless now the food that's prepared for us. May it nourish us. And please keep us safe. In Jesus' name, amen.